music you love here on VOA One The Hits. Welcome to Learning English, a daily 30 minute program from the Voice of America. I'm Dan Friedel. And I'm Katie Weaver. This program is aimed at English learners. So we speak slowly and we use words and phrases, especially written for people learning English. Today on the show, we have reports from Brian Lynn, Dan Novak, and John Russell. Later, Ana Mateo brings us words and their stories, and Gregory Stockel has the education report. But first... India has put into effect a new law that makes it easier for non-Muslim minorities to seek Indian citizenship. The much-debated law was first approved by India's parliament in 2019, but the government of Indian Prime Minister Narendra Modi delayed implementing the measure because of huge protests by groups opposed to it. Tens of thousands of people took part in demonstrations against the law shortly after it was approved in December 2019. At the time, news organizations reported at least 23 people were killed during days of protests. The law seeks to give Indian citizenship to Hindus, Christians, Buddhists, and other minorities who fled Bangladesh, Pakistan, and Afghanistan to escape mistreatment based on religion. Muslims are not covered by the law. Modi's Hindu nationalist-led government has said the law is designed to ease the suffering of many people who long faced unfair treatment in India. Critics say the measure is a government attempt to marginalize India's 200 million Muslims. A message issued by the Prime Minister's office confirmed the new law had been activated. The Modi government announces implementation of Citizenship Amendment Act, a spokesperson wrote in a text message. The measure is an important policy of Modi's ruling Bharatiya Janata Party. The spokesperson said the measure clears the way for the persecuted to find citizenship in India. A statement by the Home Ministry said the law aims to remove legal barriers to citizenship for refugees in order to provide a dignified life to those who have long suffered in India. The statement added that many misconceptions had been spread among the public about the law. This act is only for those who have suffered persecution for years and have no other shelter in the world except India, it said. The government said citizenship seekers can begin the process by entering their information online through an official website. Human rights group Amnesty India criticized implementation of the law, saying it legitimizes discrimination based on religion. Opponents have argued that if the law aims to protect persecuted minorities, it should have included Muslim religious minorities. The critics say these groups, including Ahmadis in Pakistan and Rohingyas in Myanmar, have already faced persecution in their own countries. The opposition Communist Party of India, which rules the southern state of Kerala, called for statewide protests to demonstrate their opposition to the measure. Kerala's chief minister, P. 
Pinarayi Vijayan said in a statement he sees the law leading to more divisions and believes it is not in line with the country's constitution. This move to stratify Indian citizens who have equal rights must be opposed unitedly. India's 200 million Muslims make up a large minority group in the country's 1.4 billion population. Muslims live in almost every part of the country. They have been targeted in a series of attacks since Modi first came to power in 2014. I'm Brian Lynn. Artificial intelligence, or AI, is adding to the threat of election disinformation worldwide. The technology makes it easy for anyone with a smartphone and an imagination to create fake but convincing content aimed at fooling voters. Just a few years ago, fake photos, videos, or audio required teams of people with time, skill, and money. Now, free and low-cost generative artificial intelligence services from companies like Google and OpenAI permit people to create high-quality deepfakes with just a simple text entry. A wave of AI deepfakes tied to elections in Europe and Asia has already appeared on social media for months. It served as a warning for more than 50 countries having elections this year. Some recent examples of AI deepfakes include a video of Moldova's pro-Western president throwing her support behind a political party friendly to Russia, audio of Slovakia's Liberal Party leader discussing changing ballots and raising the price of beer, a video of an opposition lawmaker in Bangladesh, a conservative Muslim-majority nation, wearing a bikini. The question is no longer whether AI deepfakes could affect elections, but how influential they will be, said Henry Eider who runs a business advisory company called Latent Space Advisory in Britain. You don't need to look far to see some people being clearly confused as to whether something is real or not, Eider said. As the U.S. presidential race comes closer, Christopher Wray, the director of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, issued a warning about the growing threat of generative AI. He said the technology makes it easy for foreign groups to attempt to have a bad influence on elections. With AI deepfakes, a candidate's image can be made much worse or much better. Voters can be moved toward or away from candidates, or even to avoid the polls altogether. But perhaps the greatest threat to democracy, experts say, is that the growth of AI deepfakes could hurt the public's trust in what they see and hear. The complexity of the technology makes it hard to find out who is behind AI deepfakes. Experts say governments and companies are not yet capable of stopping the problem. The world's biggest tech companies recently and voluntarily, signed an agreement to prevent AI tools from disrupting elections. For example, the company that owns Instagram and Facebook has said it will start labeling deepfakes that appear on its services. But deepfakes are harder to limit on apps like Telegram, which did not sign the voluntary agreement. Telegram uses encrypted messages that can be difficult to uncover. 
Some experts worry that efforts to limit AI deepfakes could lead to unplanned results. Tim Harper is an expert at the Center for Democracy and Technology in Washington, D.C. He said sometimes well-meaning governments or companies might crush the very thin line between political commentary and an illegitimate attempt to smear a candidate. Major generative AI services have rules to limit political disinformation, but experts say it is too easy to defeat the restrictions or use other services. AI software is not the only threat. Candidates themselves could try to fool voters by claiming events that show them in bad situations were manufactured by AI. Lisa Rappel is a researcher at the International Foundation for Electoral Systems in Arlington, Virginia. She said, A world in which everything is suspect, and so everyone gets to choose what they believe, is also a world that's really challenging for democracy. I'm John Russell. VOA Learning English has launched a new program for children. It is called Let's Learn English with Anna. The new course aims to teach children American English through asking and answering questions and experiencing fun situations. For more information, visit our website, learningenglish.voanews.com. What do you get when you cross the sports of rodeo with skiing, an extreme winter sport called ski joring? The competition involves riding horses that tow skiers by rope over jumps and around barriers. At the same time, competitors try to lance round targets with a baton, a special stick for the purpose. Ski joring is a winter sport that celebrates the combination of rodeo and ski culture in the U.S. Mountain West. Horses, and sometimes dogs, snowmobiles, and even cars, tow skiers by rope at speeds as high as 64 kilometers per hour. Skiers can go over jumps as high as 2.4 meters. One of the most popular ski drawing races in the country takes place in Leadville, Colorado. The event, called the Granddaddy of a Mall, has been a tradition there since 1949. It's just the pure adrenaline that gets me to do it, said Nick Burry. He is one of the competitors and said teams get along with each other. Getting these two different groups of people together with the riders and the skiers, we mesh pretty well. Internet reports say skijoring takes its name from the Norwegian word skijoring, which means ski driving. It started as a way to get around in Scandinavia and became popular in Europe's Alps Mountains around 1900. Today's sport is dangerous and injuries are common among riders and skiers alike. One of the first riders in the Leadville race earlier this month fell off his horse and had to be helped off the track. Burry did well in the competition, although he was skiing with a separated shoulder that he suffered in a fall during a race two weeks earlier. Savannah McCarthy has been a competitive ski drawer since she was 12 years old. She said she experiences a nervous energy before she rides her horse for a race. But once she is speeding down the course, her world goes silent. I don't hear a thing when I'm running, she said. When it's happening, you really don't have time to think about anything. McCarthy is a 24-year-old financial worker from Durango, Colorado. She has won the Leadville race nine times. Lauren Zimanskova is head of Ski Jor USA, which helps organize races across the country. 
She said ski joring is becoming more popular because of social media. She hopes it will one day be an event in the Winter Olympics. Ski joring is especially popular in Poland and Switzerland, as well as in the U.S. states of Colorado, Wyoming, and Montana. Five years ago, the sport had about 350 teams of riders, skiers, and horses in the U.S., she said. Now, about 1,000 teams are competing, and the number of races has increased from about 15 a year to more than 30. But getting the sports into the Olympics has proven difficult. There is no official governing body. It has no clear set of rules. And there is no system that would permit riders to take part in the Winter Games. In addition, every course is different, and every race has its own special traditions. Zhimanskova is pushing to include ski joring as a non competitive demonstration sport. She said it could also be included in the torch relay at the 2034 Winter Olympics in Salt Lake City, Utah. Everyone loves snow, and then you add horses to that, Zhimanskova said. I mean, all the elements that go into a ski joring event, in my opinion, Are really feel good elements, she added. I'm Dan Novak. A growing number of students from India are studying at foreign universities as a generation of young people prepare for jobs they cannot find at home. India estimates 1.5 million students are studying at foreign universities. That is eight times more than in 2012. And no country is attracting more Indian students than the U.S. Many Indian students think studying at foreign universities is a way to find jobs in other countries. American schools gain from the increase. At the same time, enrollment by students from China has decreased. U.S. universities have turned to India as a new source of students who pay full price for education. India's economy is growing, but many young people with university degrees are jobless. Jobs are being created in fields such as construction and agriculture. But they do not meet the demands of a newly educated workforce, said Rosa Abraham. She is an economist at Azim Premji University. Reports say India's own higher education system is not big enough to deal with demand. As the population increases, Competition for entrance to India's top universities has increased too. Acceptance rates at some top Indian universities have fallen to as low as 0.2%, compared to 3% at Harvard University and 4% at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. Universities in Canada, Australia, and Britain also are seeing increasing interest. But interest is highest in U.S. universities, which enroll nearly 269,000 students from India, 
and that number is increasing. There was a 35% increase in the 2022 to 2023 school year. India is getting closer to replacing China as the largest international student body in U.S. universities. The majority of Indian students are coming for graduate programs in science, math, and engineering. Those fields face shortages in the U.S., but undergraduate numbers also are rising as India's middle class grows. Studying in the U.S. offers the chance to work in the country for up to three years after graduation. The U.S. government program is known as Optional Practical Training. Accepting more foreign students increases income for American universities because international students pay higher tuition. However, the number of students coming from China has been decreasing, possibly because of political tensions and a slowing Chinese economy. In India, American universities have become a common site at university fairs aimed at getting students to apply to schools. Many U.S. schools are spending a lot of money to gain name recognition in India. American universities are spreading their efforts farther across the country to find students in smaller cities and towns, where demand for foreign study has been rising. But for the majority of India's young people, an overseas education remains out of reach. The cost of a U.S. education is too high for most. In addition, Indian banks have decreased the number of student loans they give, because a large number of borrowers fail to repay them. For those who can pay the high tuition costs, the student visa process also can create barriers. At the U.S. Embassy in New Delhi, those asking for student visas are often turned down. Recently, Daisy Chima's visa was rejected. She spent weeks preparing for a visa meeting after getting accepted to Westcliff University, a for-profit university in California. She paid for an agency to help with the process, but her visa was rejected with no reason provided. She just received a piece of paper saying she could reapply. Chima is 22. She hoped to gain work experience in the U.S. before returning to India to support her family. Her parents, who own a gas station in the northern state of Punjab, were going to pay with their savings. I feel terrible right now, said Chima, holding back tears. But I will prepare more and try again. I'm not giving up. I'm Gregory Stockel. And now, words and their stories from VOA Learning English. Have you ever looked closely at a piece of wood? If you have, you might have noticed its beautiful grain. When talking about wood, grain describes the appearance of cell fibers in the wood. A wood's grain is important when choosing the right sort of wood for a project. Different kinds of wood have different grains, which affect their appearance, strength, and usefulness. Paying attention to a wood's grain helps you to know how to work with it. For example, if you are cutting a wood board with the grain, you would use a tool called a ripsaw. 
If you are cutting across the grain, you would use a crosscut saw. Cutting against the grain is more difficult. If you work against the wood grain, you might tear out pieces of wood or even damage your tools. And that brings us to our expression to go against the grain. If you go against the grain, you do something differently from what is normal or usual. An idea or action that goes against the grain is difficult to do or accept. Usually, it goes against a person's ideals, beliefs, or principles. If an idea or action goes against the grain, it is the opposite of what you believe is right or normal. You might find it difficult to accept. In some situations, it takes courage to go against the grain of what others are saying or doing and stand up for what you believe in. Let's say a friend of yours is offered a sales job. To do the job well, he must convince people to buy things they don't need. He is a very honest man, so for him, this job goes against the grain. To go against the grain can also mean to do things differently from others. Sometimes we want to go against the grain. We don't want to do things the way everyone else does. Artists often try to go against the grain and ignore the common, popular trends of the day. Now, let's hear the expression used between two friends. Did you hear about Jenny taking that corporate banking job? I did. I'm really happy for her. Happy? You must be kidding. Jenny is an artist. In college, we used to protest against big banks. I know we did, but life is different now. We're older and have bills to pay. And I think Jenny wants to send her little sister to college. I know, but a corporate job? Jenny? It just goes against the grain for her. Look, we need to support our friend. Anything less would go against the grain for me. And that's the end of this Words and Their Stories. Until next time, I'm Ana Mateo. You just heard this week's Words and Their Stories. Ana Mateo joins me now. What a treat to talk to you, Ana. Thanks for having me on your show, Katie. In your story, you talked about going against the grain. We use this in a couple of different ways. Would you explain a bit more? Sure. You can go against the grain by doing your own thing. You don't pay attention to what others think you should do. Can you give us an example? Of course. Let's say you come from a family of lawyers. Everyone is a lawyer. Your mom, your grandmother, your father and his father, even your younger sister is a lawyer. But you go against the grain and become a winemaker. Oh, that is definitely going against the grain and up the grapevine. What are some other ways to use this expression? Well, if an idea or action goes against the grain, it is the opposite of what you believe is right or normal. I've got one, an example. My sister is terrified of heights. She went against the grain when she climbed Mount Everest. That's a great example. She didn't really, but she does have a fear of heights. Well, thank you for coming on the show. It was fun to chat with you, Anna. Thanks for having me, Katie. 
That's all the time we have for today's show, but join us again tomorrow for another VOA Learning English program. Thanks for listening. I'm Katie.